Well, I just had a new experience. Oak walked up to me and told me I had more time. I'm used to getting up here and having to say, oh, we're running out of time, because you cut it back. <laughs> so, and uh, that's never a problem. But I want to thank Oak. I am so excited to be here today, and I want to thank Oak because Oak is giving me permission to talk about my favorite thing in all the world, and that's homeschooling my children. And uh, why? Why am I so excited? Well, I think we've heard a lot today that it would say why, because if you homeschool your children, that's truly agency-based education. We have it in our home, and we had it in our home, and we've loved every minute of it. I started homeschooling my children about, oh, maybe 33 years ago, and there wasn't a lot of people doing it then, at least where I lived. I happened to live in Boise, Idaho at the time, and we were the first family in Boise to receive permission to uh, educate our children at home. And uh, how do you like that word, permission? <laughs> it, and it was quite an ordeal. Maybe the reason I love it so much is because I had to work so hard for it. They questioned everything, right down to our music, music program. In fact, as they questioned everything that we would take to them, and we had a very large family, and we had to meet with the school board and meet with the attorneys. And I mean, it was just a different process than what you go through now when you are in an area where you're kind of pioneering what's going on there. And uh, so as we would meet with all these people and they'd ask us un unbelievable questions and as usual I had a baby in my arms and, and I have 12 children so it wasn't unusual to have a baby in my arms and uh, they would try to, to say well you're just overprotective you don't, you know one, one said to me I think your problem is is that you just can't let go I said at that point I had ten, you know maybe 9 or 10 children I said <laughs> You know, can't let go. What are you talking about? I just want what's right for my children. I just want what's right for my children. The music program thing was kind of a funny thing because after they tried everything else to tell us why we just, they couldn't see that we were going to be able to do this. Are you really going to be able to do this? And we had an answer for everything. And finally they got us. It was on the music. How could we possibly treat these little elementary children and, and, and our high school children music? Because I'm not musical. And... But you know what? I got to thinking about that, and we went back, and they asked us more questions about music, and I said, huh, well, our children take piano lessons. Uh, they take you know, choir. We talked about all the music things that they already do, but oh, it's not the same as in the school. And I said, so now, who is your, you know, who, who's over at music for the, for the elementary schools in Boise, for Boise School District? Mark Griffin, they said. I said, oh, great, solves the problem. Mark Griffin happened to be in my ward, and he happened to be our children's piano teacher and taught them all their music. <laughs> so that was the end of that when we moved on, and, and they, they, they signed all the papers, and we were allowed to teach our children at home. And what a joy, and what a, it's just been wonderful. It was, it was such an adventure, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Now people say, really? You know, and in fact, I loved it so much about my children. We'd, we'd all be together, and we'd be learning something together, and I'm so excited, and I'd just say, isn't this fun? Isn't this just so fun? And then my, oh, you know, my children would look at me and say, Mom, you need to get a life. You know, but, but that's how much I loved it, and I think that's part of the reason why we had a lot of the successes we had, because of the attitude, because of the feeling, because of the love of, of, uh, of teaching my children. And you know what? Do you, don't you love your children? Don't you get excited doing things with your children? Well, education is what we are supposed to be teaching our children. Everything is an education. Everything is an education. And, I, and you know, as I was, I had a lot of children, as I said. And I, at this point, when I started teaching my children at home, I had high school age children already. And uh, I was watching what, what was happening as they were moving through the system. And you know what I discovered? I wasn't done with them. I hadn't had enough time. It was time for them. They were going to start leaving my home. They were going to go off to college. And I could think of all the things that I hadn't taught them yet. And why? Because when at a little tiny little age, at age five, other people started interfering in that and getting in the way of all the things I needed to teach my children that I had to teach my children. And we just ran out of time. The older they got, the more they are away from me. And I didn't get to teach them everything. And that was really bothering me. I thought, there has to be a better way. And then there was the homework. Do you know how much homework you have when you've got children from kindergarten up? I mean, we were truly K through 12. 
And when you are K through 12 in your home and, and you've got homework every night, oh, it was exhausting. And none of us were happy. I stayed up late, late, late. I'd start with the little ones and, you know, at midnight we were still trying to get the high school children through their homework. And that wasn't fun. It was stress. It was pressure. And they felt it. And I thought, I don't think it's supposed to be this way either. And I got to thinking about all the hours I spent just with homework after they'd been away from me from all day long. And I thought, can I take those same hours and do something better with them? But you know what? I didn't know about homeschool. That was the problem. I didn't know about homeschool. And so I was continuing through that process. And then one day, I happened to hear a, a woman by the name of Joyce Kenmont talk about homeschool. Do any of you in this room know Joyce? Yeah, yeah. And I, didn't, I, didn't, I lived in Idaho at the time, and I didn't get to Utah until a few years later. But I listened, and I thought, what? Homeschool? What's that? I was so excited I could hardly stand it. In fact, she was on a television program I was watching. I went to the phone quickly, and I called up my friend. Quick, turn on the television. This is the greatest thing you've ever heard in your life. And so she turned it on, and the minute that show was over, I put, went back and I called my friend and I said, wasn't that the most wonderful thing you ever heard? And you know what? She was furious. She thought it was the dumbest thing she'd ever heard, and she was mad at me for saying, saying it was great. She started telling me how dumb it was. I said, oh my gosh. Well, the next day happened to be Thanksgiving, and my other friend, I only had two, I mean, real friends, you know, there was three of us that were really close, and my other friend and her family were coming for dinner. And so as we were getting the rest of the stuff on the table, I thought to myself, huh, one down, I'll try this one. So I said, because my husband, see, I actually should back up. When my husband came home from work that night, I said, I just heard about the greatest thing, and I'm going to do it. And I told him, and he said, oh, my gosh, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. Let's go. And so we, that was it. The decision was made. So I thought, I'll just bounce this off my other friend, and I did. And you know what she said? She said, Thank goodness, I always knew I was going to do this. I was just waiting for somebody else. <laughs> she didn't tell me. All these years she had files and she hadn't shared a thing with me. So we showed that third friend, ha ha. We're two against one now. And by the way, she never did join us, but at least she started talking to me again. But then my friend did a terrible thing. She moved. She left the Boise School District and left me all alone. Here we were fighting this battle, and she just moved away. I don't know, oh my gosh, you know. But, but it was okay. It was okay because I had my husband, I had my children, and my older children were helping me, and we researched, and we did all kinds of things, and we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And it worked, and we put it all together. But that was, of course, that was just the beginning. You know what happens when, you, you, when homeschool is just something really new, and, and all of a sudden... You're t you start to tell your family. <laughs> my mother, true story, my mother would wait until after 3 o'clock to come to my house. That way she didn't have to face the reality that her grandchildren were home all day with their mother. She just showed up at 3 o'clock like it hadn't happened all day. <laughs> and, pretended, and then she decided that my children were going to absolutely, they were going to be the dumbest children in the world. And so she fretted and worried about that and, and didn't ever tell her friends. She kept it a secret because she didn't want her friends to know. And then we went, as we went down the road and the children were doing so well, then she was really stressed because she was afraid that if anything ever happened and they had to go back to school, they'd be too smart and they wouldn't fit in. So, you know, but we just kept loving Grandma, you know. So, and that, that worked out really well. So did we have to make changes? Yes. Did we have to make changes in our lifestyle? Yes. The best one was we didn't stay up all night doing homework anymore. We just did it in the day. Worked out really well. But we made a lot of changes. But don't you do that as you have children? I bet you made a lot of changes when your first child was born. And then as he went on and went on, and someday you had seven children, you really make a lot of changes, don't you, Lisa? But when you teach them at home, freedom. The word was freedom. I can't say enough about how much we loved our freedom. I taught my children, my husband. Well, my husband taught the children, too, though. That was kind of stressful for them. They hated to go ask him a question because when they asked me a question, I gave them a two-minute answer. They asked him a question, and a half hour later, their eyes are crossed, and they're coming and saying, Mom, don't make me ask Dad that question again. But, but we loved it, and we did it together, and we had so much fun. You know what? What's great about homeschooling? You can go to Disneyland at the craziest time and, you can, and no lines. It was just wonderful. You can travel all over the country. You can set one day aside. It's the family day to go on our field trips. We did so many fun things, and we had such a good time. But best of all, my children, my children were each other's best friends. 
Now, it sounds like it's a lot of work. And you know what? It is. It's a lot of work. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. But it's fun. And it's gratifying. And do you know how much I love my children being each other's best friends? They're still each other's best friends in all the world. Did it solve all of our problems? No. Do I have children who I wish had made better choices? Yes. I wish I could stand here and tell you that if you'll homeschool your children, everything's going to be glorious, and you, you won't have any problems, and that's just not true. But you know how much easier it is to handle your problems? And do you know as your children may go through life and make choices and maybe make choices that you're not happy with? Because you have established this incredible foundation, because you are each other's best friends, the children are each other's best friends, guess what? I'm their best friend. They say so. And you establish this relationship so as the problems come, they're so much easier. Now, you have to make changes in your life as you do that. I'm going to back up and just tell you one little story. I have a daughter. I have a daughter who has made choices that are certainly not the choices that we would have her make. And, and she's, she's a vivacious, very cute, very outgoing child and, and has lots of friends and a lot of people know her. And, they get to, and as they get to visiting with her, you know, our last name's not Smith. And that makes it very difficult in this state for my children because we're the only ones in the state with the last name of Rizika. Doesn't go all, you know, so when, there's, when they sit in college classes and with professors and others, sometimes it's not easy for them. Um, and so as with this daughter, when people find out who she is, the question, and the question they ask her so often, it's so stupid. She's your mother? Does she like you? <laughs> Does she like you? My daughter always says the same thing, and I love it. She says, she loves me. She's my very best friend. And why does she feel that way about me? Because we spent so much time together. She didn't have, if, she, if she ran off to school, she'd find other best friends, wouldn't she? But she hung around with me. She hung around with her sisters and her brothers. And guess what? We're all her best friends. And she, we're all we're always there for her. And she's always there for us. But we had, you know, there's things that you have to do. Things that you have to change. You have to get organized. And that's what, again, the scriptures, there they are. There's the scriptures, everything for you. And the first thing for us in getting organized is, right, if you go to Doctrine and Covenants 88, and you start with verse 118, it says, and as all have not faith, seek ye diligently and teach one, one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. But you know, it says diligently. And so we were very diligent. And I was very diligent. And here's the thing. Listen to some of these others. You start on verse 119. Organize yourself. Prefer, prepare every needful thing and establish a house even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. So I just sat down with my children. We opened those scriptures. We went to those scriptures. And I said, what does that mean? OK, there's lots of meaning in there. And there's lots of meaning. And you know, right away, what is a house of God? And if you look at the, the order of this, that, as we went through the order, and we don't have time to go through all the details today, but for us, that was something we could study and work on together and make decisions. And the one thing we knew, we had to have a house of order. Our home, our physical home that we were living in, had to be a house of order, or I wouldn't have time to do this, would I? Because that's the first thing people always say. How can you keep your house clean and spend all this time? So we started talking about house of order. I had to talk about organizing myself first. And the first thing I had to decide was, this is t I'm going to teach my children. How much time am I going to set aside for that that's just for them? And we made the decision, my husband and myself first, that that time would be from the time we got out of bed in the morning for me and for him together, because we started our morning with morning devotionals that were just great and so fun, because we had to make it fun for the children so they wanted to get out of bed. So we found ways to do that. Then I didn't have to, you know, when they were in public school, you know, I had to go through to get them out of bed. Sometimes it even took a spray bottle, you know? I mean, whatever it took. And then to have them come to, you know, to family prayer where, you know, when it's their blankets around them and they're in a heap on the floor. I was always surprised when and that, we looked over to that heap and it was their turn to read the scriptures and underneath the blanket did come this mumbling, so at least they were, knew it was their turn. 
And we want to change all that. So we had this opportunity to do it, and we did. We did what we had to do to change that. And the decision I made for me personally was until 1 o'clock every day, I would not take phone calls. Visiting teachers didn't come. I didn't uh, have company. I didn't go anywhere. Till 1 o'clock was that time that I set aside that was just for my my children for our time schooling. Didn't mean we did, didn't do some things in the afternoon, but I left the afternoons open for visiting, teaching, for phone calls, for even my mother, you know. <laughs> okay, but she still I usually called after three. But, you know, it, whatever we needed to do, that changed everything. That took all the pressure off of me because that was their time. That's how we did it. And then we would work after 1 o'clock on those things that worked in. So, so that was one of the things in organizing for me. But then we had to organize our house, didn't we? And so we took the, what would be the first week of school after all the other children went back to school. We, you know, I'd be at meetings and things, and mothers would all be talking about, oh, next week the children go back to school. Oh, great, next week the children go back to school. And one day our bishop's wife said at one of these meetings to me, she says, well, Gail can't say that, because back in those days, we were the only homeschoolers around. Gail can't say that, but she's grateful that you know children are going back to school. I says, oh, yes, I can. I am so grateful your children are going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> because then my children were mine again. And I was able to do those things. And so we spend the first week organizing our house. Now, do you know what happens when you take a little one and you put them in charge of, of cleaning out the silverware drawer and putting everything in the way it's right place? They own that silverware drawer, don't they? Don't you mess up their silverware drawer, and if it gets messed up, they clean it. Well, guess what? As we spent that week with organizing our home and I get children assignments and things, they took, they took ownership in that. And when everything was organized, all this pressure was off of me. And boy, after the summer, you need that. And so that pressure was off. Well, then the next week, we would spend organizing our school, setting up our files, talking about their curriculum, setting up their personal files, my files, and guess what? At the end of that week, we were all organized. Now, did my children learn anything? Could we say, oh, we hadn't started school yet? Back then, there was laws that said you had to teach so many hours. We, we, you know, after a couple of months, you meant the hours, because you know what? School's all going, isn't it? It's not. But 1 o'clock, when I changed what, how we did things, didn't mean schooling ended. It just meant they got into projects, they taught each other, they did other things, and I, you know, I came along. Well, what about when I had to do, it was canning, it was fall, it was time to can. Do you know how great science lessons you have when you're teaching children how to can? There are so many things. It's all schooling. And we, so we still did it. We still managed to fill our shelves with, with, with all kinds of stuff, that, you know, canned items, and the freezers were full, and everybody was working hard, and we still had time to read. We had time to do all those things because we organized it so we had it done. Now, some people say, but I've got a baby. You know, so did I. I always had a baby right here, you know. Or what about the toddlers? Oh, yeah, what about the toddlers? You're right. Ask that question. You think the teenagers are bad? Deal with those toddlers when you're trying to do other things. Well, you know, I had various things. I remember one time we were all just busy, and all of a sudden we looked around. Uh, uh, where's the baby? Where'd she go? And we, I heard noise in the kitchen. I went in the kitchen, and I got in there. Oh, there was flour everywhere. She had opened the turntable, got out the thing of flour, and I just stood there looking at that and all this stuff we were right in the middle of with the children, and I didn't want to leave it. And how am I going to clean up this mess? And what am I going to do about the baby? And what, you know, oh, my, I just, you know, you feel that same discouragement that you feel right now whether you're teaching your children at home or not. You know, you, you still have those things happen, doesn't think. And I looked at that kitchen for a few minutes, and the other children came running in, and they're going, oh. And I just looked around, and I said, well, I guess we're going to make chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> so we did. We made chocolate chip cookies and cleaned as we made the cookies and talked and laughed. And then we went back to what we were doing, and everybody enjoyed their cookies. And sometimes I would have to say to one of the children when the, when the, the little ones were just, I had given them everything to color. I had read them every story. I'd done everything I could do. Sometimes I had to take one of the older children and say to them, you know what, if you will take the baby and go off and play with the baby for the next hour or two. This afternoon, we will work on yours together, just the two of us. So that always worked, too. And by afternoon, when I could sit down with that child and make up for the two hours they missed and get the baby down for a nap and the other children were in their projects, it worked. It can. It worked. Because we planned. We planned. So those scriptures, they go on, and, and uh, actually, if you go up, go down to about 126, they're just full of all kinds of things about organizing, why you should organize, what it is that you can share with your children. 
But now you talk about curriculum. Where do I get my curriculum? Well, back when I started, you didn't have all the things that you have now, and big conventions and curriculum fairs and all kinds of stuff. And, and one of the conditions for us as a family to be able to get permission to homeschool was uh, they had to come out and, 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 and look at our home. They had to, they had to come through our home and make sure we had all kinds of things because suddenly now that we were, we could live in that home without any investigation to rear our children, but if we were gonna add to the rearing of our children their formal education, then they came out and checked us out. Fortunately for us, that we, you know, we had to have a school school room, a school room. So we set up in our basement, I mean, the desk and all the desk. We had the best looking school room because they were coming to investigate us, you know. And fortunately for us, we had an outside entrance to our basement, so they allowed us to homeschool. See, that was in the rules that if there, you know, you had to have outside entrance to get out of basements, not to rear your children, not to have children, but to teach them at home. So we had a great school room and. We never used it till after school when the other children came to play, and then they'd play school down in our schoolroom. <laughs> Meanwhile, we were upstairs you know, on the kitchen table or w cuddled up on the couch like, as I called my warm fuzzy and teaching my children to read. But we had a schoolroom, and we passed. And, and so then I started to look at curriculum. Well, they said to me, well, you, you know, curriculum's are really a problem. And so we, here, you have a pass, and we're going to let you go to over to this place, we did in Boise, and over in Caldwell was where they sold the, the textbooks. You go over there and you pick out your textbooks. So I went over there as I was commanded and picked out the textbooks. They were so bad I didn't even send them to the DI, I just put them in the garbage because I didn't want any child to be exposed to that. <laughs> but I did what I was supposed to. But then lo and behold, the man who was over uh, elementary education for, for the state of, uh, for the school district, the Boise School District, had to come out and watch me teach. One of the things I had picked and was choosing to teach my children were these wonderful little books uh, about the Articles of Faith. They don't have many more, but they were, there, was, there were three volumes, and we used those books to teach. I had him, he observed it to teach religion. And uh, fortunately, they hadn't outlawed that in our home yet. And, and he, but he was a Catholic man who watched that and he sat there through, he, he spent a day, the whole day with us, you know, to see, make sure I was doing this right. And at the end of the day, he said, oh, how I wish my church had materials like that for the children. And so he approved us and went off and didn't come back again. But in looking for curriculum, I had to have the children be excited about what we had to teach, right? What is it? Would, again, in the scriptures, if you go again to Doctrine and Covenants 88, and if you start with uh, verse 78, it says, Teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you. You know, I'm going to that you may be instructed more perfectly, and we'll go through what that says, but teach ye diligently, and my grace shall attend you. What more could you want in teaching your children but to have God's grace attending you? What a promise, and what a promise to share with the children. And it talks about teaching each other. Teach one another. And it goes on, and it lists all the things, because in, in verse 77, it does say, teach, ye, uh, teach one another the doctrines of the kingdom. And then it goes on there and says, it, you know, you'll instruct them more perfectly in theory, in principle, in doctrine, in the laws of the gospel, and all things that pertain to the kingdom of God that are expected, expedient for you to understand, things that are both in the heaven and in the earth and under the earth, and things that have been, things which are, things which must shortly come to pass, things which are at home, things which are abroad, the wars and the perplexities of the nation, and the judgments which are in the land, and a knowledge also of countries and of kingdoms. Wow. And we don't know where to find a curriculum. And, and the children, we would, we would write this down. They kept these, these uh, educational journals all the time. And, and, and it was all about, they would, they would write journal pages about themselves. You can do that at home. Don't ever let your children do that in the public schools. Don't ever let them write educational pages about themselves. That's called surveying your children. Say no. But at home, it's a different story. So at home, you can do this. And, and so uh, that's, that's what we did. And they wrote these things down. They listed them. They had a long list of them. And then we would write, what does this mean? What is it that we need to teach? Well, I mean, things are in the future, things in the past, things above, things below, in the earth. It's everything. And we would list each one of those things. Do you know what a difference that makes when children know that this is a commandment from God, that they know these things? And why? 
Well, we would, we would talk, we would spend so much time the whole school year, because we started every school year this way. We would remind them of this. We had so many things that we were teaching the children and that they were teaching each other and they were teaching us. Oh, I've never learned so much in all my life as when I homeschooled my children. And so all this excitement as they learned from these things and knew what they meant and why, why did they need to do these things? Well, it says in verse 80 that you may be prepared in all things when I shall send you again to magnify the calling whereunto I have called you. If they're going to magnify their calling, they have to learn all these things. And, and you know, how can they create earth, their own earth, if they don't know these things? You've got to have math, huh? You can't, you can't create an earth without math. And, and, and now the other question people would say, well, how do you teach so many different ages at once? That was the best part. And no, didn't they used to do that anyway? Weren't all the children in the same class? And the little ones, listening to me t teaching the older ones, are learning what they're learning. You know, we never taught to the lowest denominator, just the opposite. I mean, they had their times that I spent with them, but they loved to know what their, ch what their brothers and sisters knew. One of the examples, we would use the scriptures for various things, and I thought, okay, so I was teaching them math. And I taught them all the same math from the scriptures. We were talking, teaching them math about the last days of, of the Book of Mormon, with, with, when Mormon was in, in the Valley of Cumorah. And they, they were talking, and he, you remember how in the scriptures it talks about the battles? And he names all the, the, the generals, and then this, the general and his 10,000, this general and his 10,000. And all of a sudden there was just another 10 generals they didn't even mention, but they had 10,000 too. And so they're, they're mentioning all these. And my little boys are a little, little, little young. They're over there, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to read all this. But I want you to tell me how many all together in the Valley of Camorra, how many were killed? And those little boys, they're writing down 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. And, and they got through, and they were rushing over there, and they were adding up and adding up. And there's their sisters over here, and they gave me the answer. Huh? How could you possibly have the answer right now? Well, these were just little guys who hadn't been taught multiplication yet. But their sisters all knew multiplication. So they were just waiting and they multiplied. Guess what? Those boys were not going to be outdone and they learned multiplication right away. They wanted to know multiplication. You know how much easier it is to teach something when they want to learn it? When they can see a reason for it? So many, many wonderful things about homeschooling. And yes, you can do it. Yes, you can have a clean house and teach your children. Uh, I had one time this, this girl who kept coming to me wanted to homeschool, and her husband kept saying no. We lived in Arizona at the time, and boy, when we moved to Arizona, we thought we'd move to a communist country. Not only did, uh, did the children have to be tested, the parents had to be tested. But anyway, that's another story. But she came, she came coming and talked to me. So one night we had a big homeschool meeting at my home, and her husband came with her. And the next day she called me, and she said, he said, yes, after he'd been saying no and no and no. And I said, why? She said, your house was clean. He went into your bathroom. Your bathroom was cleaner than mine. And he decided, if you can homeschool all those children and have a clean house, I can homeschool. So yes, you can keep your house clean. Your children help you do it. And yes, you can teach children at different ages. And yes, you can teach teenagers. You not only can teach teenagers and survive it, you can teach teenagers and love it. You become closer as a family, so much closer. You know, as I said, we, we practiced real agency-based education in our home. And how did we do that? Well, we let them choose. They would, some of them would make choices to go over because of dual enrollment laws in this state. They made, they made uh, choices to go take some classes at the school. But you know what? They weren't there because they had to be there. Yes, they were there because they wanted to be there, but they were also there as a privilege. And so if they didn't conduct themselves accordingly in the school, or if they made wrong associations, guess what? It was okay, well, we tried it. It didn't work. So they knew what the rules were, our rules, not the school's rules. They knew what the rules in our home were. If you're going to go over there, this is what you'll abide by. And they did that, and they loved being there. For the, They just went over to take choir and drama and some of those things. But at the same time, I had their teachers tell me over and over all about all the problems they didn't have with my children because if there had been a problem, my children wouldn't have been there. And they learned that right away. That's choice. That's making real choices and taking advantage. We did private school, home school, uh, and some little bits of, of uh, the 
you know, public school here and there, and we made it work, and they had choices. I had a son who had a class he took over there early every other day in the morning. And he would pick up, he, you know, this was in high school, he had this little car that he'd bought, his little fancy black car, and he would drive it and pick up his friends. Well, the school called me and they said, you know, he's arriving late every day because he's picking up these friends. So I said, okay, Jordan, you got three choices here. One, you cannot go back. If you can't be there on time, if you're gonna go there, you gotta, you gotta do what's right. So you gotta be on time. So if you can't be on time, you can't go. Or, if you still wanna go there, you have two choices there. You can continue to drive that little fancy car, see that you, your car sitting on the driveway and pick up your friends, but your friends better know that if they're not ready, you're gonna leave them because you gotta be on time. Or, there's this big yellow thing, bus, that pulls up in front of our house. And anybody that gets on that bus is on time. And so he picked the black little black car and continued to go and he was happy, but choice, choice. It was agency based. One last thing, because another thing that people ask me all the time is, but how do you do this and everybody get along? You know, children fight and argue. They get into little squabbles. When they get into squabbles, we as parents tend to be part of the problem because you hear a squabble and you run out onto the scene and you're right there and suddenly the next thing you know, they've drawn you into their argument and it, probably, and it gets worse because they, they want you to take sides. They want, and so I said to my husband, we can't, we can't have contention in the home. I can't do this with this contention in the home. I don't, I don't, you're not supposed to have contention in the home. So we looked at the scriptures, we prayed about it. We found the scriptures that we found work for us that we took to the children. And we said, okay, here's the problem, children. Contention, can't have contention in a home. So we need you to work with us and we need to decide what we can do to stop contention in our home. And I wanna share those scriptures with you because it's in my, Mosiah 4.14 where it says, and you will not suffer your children that they go hungry or naked, neither will you suffer that they transgress the laws of God and fight and quarrel one with another and serve the devil who is the master of sin, who is the evil, evil spirit which has been spoken of by our fathers, he being an enemy to all righteousness. And then the next verse, it tells you what to do. It tells you why you can't have you know, quarreling because you're serving the devil. And, it, and it's a commandment of God that you not have your children fight and quarrel in the home. So when people say to you, there's no other way. There's no way to stop children from, from fighting and quarreling. Would God at, tell you this? Would he ask you to not let this happen in your home if there was no way to stop it? I don't believe that at all. And I didn't believe that when I read that. And then the next verse tells you how to do it. But you will teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness. You will teach them to love one another and serve one another. And so we sat down with our children, we shared those scriptures with them, and I pointed out that I just can't tolerate this anymore, children, because if I let you fight and quarrel, I'm breaking the commandments. And if I'm breaking the commandments, what does that mean? I don't get to go to the celestial kingdom, and I want, we all want to be there. So what can we do? And so we took those next things, and we talked about, but you'll teach them to walk in the ways of truth and soberness and to love one another and serve one another. And we came up with a little plan that worked in our home. Everybody has to look at their own plans, but our little thing was... When mama arrives on the scene, I'm not going to become part of the problem. I'm going to help you solve the problem. And how are we going to solve the problem? Well, we're going to stop the quarreling right then. And the person, sometimes it's just one person who's responsible, but we let them know that if you join in, it doesn't matter who starts it. It's not about who starts it. If you join in, then you're just as responsible as the one who started it. And what should we do? Well, first thing we do, we stop but we're, and we say we're sorry. But you know, sometimes that just doesn't quite all do it. So we decided that it would be nice to sing a little song. So they decided we'd have to pick some out some of those kindness songs. You know, I want to be kind to everyone. Because that, and, and so they would have to sing a song. Now, some children had to sing it two or three or four times. <laughs> but they kept singing it. They kept singing it till, okay. And then the next thing was that you, you know, to love one another. So then the next thing they say is, you know, I'm sorry, I love you. And then they pick a service a service for their brother or sister. If they both were involved and they were both part of the, they both go through the process and then they serve one another. If one person sometimes is a culprit, then that person does all those things. I had one son who was a genius at never becoming part of the problem. He might have egged him on, but we couldn't prove it, you know? So, so he would just kind of stand there and grin and wait for me to show up <laughs> so he could t take in all this you know, I love you and I'm sorry, and wow, what are you going to do to make to serve me now? In fact, I had an experience one time with a daughter who uh, was getting ready to go on a date, so excited, so excited. She's going on this date, 
and uh, she leaves the bathroom. And you know, big family, not you know, not enough bathrooms. She leaves the bathroom, and while she's in her bedroom getting something to get back into the bathroom where everything is, this son who's so good at pulling these things off went in to use the bathroom. And she was late, and she was in a hurry, and she's banging on the door. Jordan, Jordan, get out of there. You probably heard me say the Jordan, name Jordan a lot, but anyway, Jordan, get out of that bathroom, you know. I got to get in there. I got to get in there. And he's taking his time. Pretty soon he walks out. She's so upset. She's so late. She's, how could you do this to me? And she's just ranting and raving. And he's just standing there. And so I hear the problem. So I, I go to see what's going on. And, you know, he's as innocent as can be and hasn't done anything. And I said, you know, Kendra, you need to tell Jordan you're sorry, honey. Huh? Mom and her and her. Jordan, can tell him you're sorry. Jordan, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But I got to go. And he says, Mom, she didn't sing the song, and she hasn't done the rest, and she's running. I'm running late. I can't do it right now. And I thought, okay, let this go right now. And he kept saying, but Mom, but Mom. I says, let it go, honey. It'll be okay. Let her get ready to go. This is going to be fine. So she gets ready to go. She's rushing around. And I kept saying, Kendra, you, you have to talk to your brother before you leave. I will. I will. So the boy comes. She hasn't talked to her brother yet. No, Jordan's standing there waiting. He's waiting. And the boy's standing there, and I said, Kendra, this is, a, you know, oh, she was so embarrassed. She stops in front of the boy. She sings her little kindness song. She gives her brother a hug, says she loves him, and I said, you can, you can serve him later, you know. And, and she, as she's leaving, going down, down the sidewalk with this young man, he's singing, got to be kind to everyone, <laughs> and, and, and of course, all his friends in the car. But you know what? It worked. It worked. And they could laugh, and they still laugh. They still sing the kindness song to each other many, many years later just for fun. Homeschooling is absolutely wonderful. You can do it. Everybody can do it. If I can do it with all my children, if I can believe in it, if I can love it. Mike Kennedy sitting over there. I've seen his wonderful homeschool family. And it's, children are so happy. Children are so happy when, when they feel that love. Agency-based education, you bet. It's called homeschool. Thank you.